you there. I uh, very recently interviewed a gentleman called Tony Day, who was the founder of China's first ever soup kitchen. Now, the Yellow River Soup Kitchen celebrates its 10th anniversary this year, and over those 10 years, they've provided aid to over 55,000 people across China. For example, during the Sichuan earthquake, they sent a group of volunteers and helped out. They've served over 145,000 meals to the homeless. They've also helped over 90 homeless people to find work. Now, during this interview, Tony elaborates on his experiences of running a soup kitchen, how it all started off, and just a few of the issues he's faced along the way. So, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. So, you have all your notes and everything ready? Yeah. Well, um, basically, what this interview is about, I'm just wanting to kind of gauge your experiences of running a charity here in China, and how it all started, and the experiences that you've had. Okay. Okay, so uh, can you introduce yourself, please? Um, okay, my name's Tony. I'm from the UK, Northwest England, and I've been in China just over, well, around about 10 and a half years. Left England 12 years ago. So what brought you to Xi'an? Um, nothing really. I, I was actually on my way to India and got a little bit lost. So um, I was, I'd been on the road a couple of years, and I was literally heading to India, and I came across the top on the Trans-Siberian Express, came through, came through China, and then I was intending to fly over to India from there and spend a while there doing some things. Uh, I came to Xi'an for three days, and I basically didn't leave. I'm still, I'm still here 10 years later, so yeah, I kind of got stuck. So, so what brought you to Xi'an? Was it just you were traveling around and Xi'an was one of your stopping points more than anything? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't really traveling since I left England. I left because while I was on the road, I just did volunteer work. I do quite a lot of meditation and stuff as well. But I, I was doing volunteer work. So if I ended up in a city or a town or whatever, and I had time, and I'd do volunteer work, and then when it was time to go, I'd move on, and I'd, I'd do whatever I'd moved on to do. And so I wasn't necessarily traveling, um, but I'm en route to India. That somebody organised the train tickets for me, like an agency, and said you should go to Xi'an and have a look. I didn't know anything about China, didn't know about Xi'an. They said, oh, the warriors are there, go and have a look. I was like, well, whatever. So I ended up here and uh, didn't really give it a thought, really. Okay, now uh, you started the first ever soup kitchen in China. Mm, allegedly, yeah. Yes, is, is that true? It was is it? True. It is, it was the first ever soup kitchen in China. Now, how did you first get the idea to start the soup kitchen? I mean, you were only really stopping off in Xi'an. Yeah, um, be because wherever I went, I did volunteer work. That's just, just what I did, really. And um, usually joining in other people's activities, other organisations or whatever, I'd find something local that I could get involved in. Uh, when I came to Xi'an, I guess I had a feeling that I'd stay a bit longer than I, than I anticipated, than I first thought. I didn't really want to stay here, it wasn't because I wanted to, I really wanted to go to India, I was actually quite excited, I had lots of things organised, but my, my gut was, was telling me not to leave. So when I decided I'd stay a while, I thought well I'm going to need to learn to speak Chinese, um, and once, whilst I was here I thought well I'll start looking for some volunteer work just to fill me time. And I, I looked and I looked for, for, for two or three months. I went around all sorts of places, asked lots of local people, went to organisations, and everywhere I went, I, I heard that there wasn't any volunteer work. Because this was, this was not China now, this was China 10 years ago, and China changes fast. So 10 years ago, the, you know, the, there wasn't these opportunities to do meaningful volunteer work. When I was getting told that, I didn't actually necessarily believe that, because I was still new here, I didn't really know how things worked. Um, so, you asked me, well, how, how did the idea come? It wasn't really an idea. What, what had happened over time, I'd seen homeless people on the streets, I'd seen the disabled uh, beggars on the streets all, all around the city centre, and I'd given food or money along the way or whatever. Giving money is not really my habit, but I like to do different things. Um, and I thought well, there must be shelters where they go to, there must be places they can eat, there must be places where they can live. And, and so the, the long story of this is that one day I was out on the street, an old lady caught me on the street, she was begging, 
and she was chasing me and chasing me. I didn't give her any money because, but like I just said, I, it's not really my habit to give money. Um, and that night, when I reflected on it, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about this. So I decided to go out the following day, find this old lady again, and, and offer to buy her some food, and maybe try and talk to her over, over, over lunch. Um, bearing in mind at that stage, my Chinese was awful, <laughs> even more awful than it is now. And um, anyway, I managed to find the lady. She wasn't interested in communicating. It was difficult anyway. She wasn't going to tell me anything. I didn't learn anything from her. So I, in the end, I just gave her some money um, because she didn't want to. I couldn't really communicate well enough to offer to. I was offering to buy her food, but she wasn't interested. She just wanted. She was there to pay for money. So I then decided that I would speak to some other homeless people, find out where they went, where the shelters were, so I could follow them along and then just turn up and ask, could I help? But I decided the night before that if, if I struck out that day and I didn't find any, anything, I didn't learn anything, then I'd start buying food. So there was never a master plan to start a soup kitchen, uh, and there still isn't. There was, never master, there was never a master plan to start a charity. It, it, it just naturally happened. So as a result, that was on a Thursday, uh, and then the f I started the first soup kitchen, as it were, on the Sunday. I started buying food, I found a group of beggars, uh, homeless people, and I, I took it along on a Sunday. And that's how it started, it was one person buying food, just giving it out to people who needed it. Nothing more than that, really. Okay, now, I mean, if you look around China, there's many more cities that are poorer than Xi'an. We only have to look at places in Gansu or Qinghai province. Now, was there any specific reason for you choosing Xi'an to set up the soup kitchen? No, no, no. And, you know, and, and for me, when I've done stuff, it's never been important about where I am, it's, it's more about what I'm doing. So I found myself in Xi'an, I found myself doing this thing. I was here because I'm doing this thing, not because I want to be in Xi'an, not because I want to be in China. You know, so which city it is or which country it is actually has never been important, really. Uh, it's worked here, and I'm sure there's reasons I, I ended up here. I don't know what they are. Nice. <laughs> just, just do what I'm told. Nice. So, uh, first starting your soup kitchen here in China, what challenges did you face? Uh, I, I think, I mean, to be fair, if, if we're all, all the Westerners here are all from, from different countries, you know. If you try and start a business in your own country, it's never going to be easy, there's always challenges, and I, and I come from a business background, I know how difficult that is. And to succeed in that long term, or even short term, is, is difficult. So starting any organisation in any country, even if it's your native country, is, is difficult. But you then factor in that you're starting um, an organisation in a foreign country where you don't really speak the language, where... The comp this was the first soup kitchen in China, and there's good reasons why it was the first soup, soup, kitchen, soup kitchen in China. So you started it in, you could say hostile environment, but, but, but it's, not, it's not within the culture. This thing is not within the culture. And I couldn't find other organisations ten years ago because there weren't any. And that's not to say that Chinese don't do charity, it's just that it wasn't available at that time. So you're starting a new organisation, in a foreign country, we've got language difficulties, you've got cultural differences, and, and cultural barriers where there's a lack of understanding about what's going on. So, chuck that lot together and give it a good old mix, and you kind of come up with a lot of challenges. I can imagine, yeah. And, and a, you know, specifics, will be, but you're gonna come up with a lot of challenges, you're bound to. But there was never a moment that I doubted that once this started, there was never a moment that I doubted that this would not be able to continue. Okay. And we're still here at the moment. <laughs> so, having a soup kitchen here in China, do you face any criticism from general members of the public? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it's, and, and, I, and I've, I've, I've got no, I've got no problems with that because it was just a lack of understanding, you know. You know, and ten years ago, there's, because Xi'an isn't Beijing or Shanghai, there's, a, you know, there isn't a, there isn't a massive expat community. There's not a lot of foreigners. So, any foreigner on the street now, never mind them it's always going to be stand out from the crowd. So a foreigner walking around with food on his back, giving it out to homeless people, and there was social stigma about those homeless people where there was a mistrust that they genuinely needed help. You know, there was a belief, and still is to an extent, that they're, they're not genuine homeless people, that they're liars, they're cheats, etc. So you, 
you stick in, you paste onto that a foreigner walking down the streets giving out food to these people, then you're going to get mixed reactions. Okay. And, and it wasn't all good. But so could could you actually give any examples? Are you able to remember any specific examples of any yeah, of the criticisms? Yeah. I mean, I mean, lots. You know, I mean, you'd literally, I could, I would get, I could at times get a lot of abuse on on the streets when we were doing it. And sometimes, what happened? It was one person started this, but then people got involved. People saw what we were doing, and some people would see what we were doing and they'd have an adverse react, which was sort of indoctrinated, and it wasn't their fault. Just a lack of understanding. But then we got all the massive positive reactions where people would see what we're doing and they're like, oh this is great, can I come along and help? Which was never really part of the plan, it just it just happened that way. Snowballed. Just snowballed. So so people would come along and say, well, we think it's great what you're doing, or can we come and help? We're like, yeah, well I'll be here next week. You're welcome. And so what happened? The people started to come along, volunteers started to come, which I never really expected. So, you know, from the outset, it's never been one person. There's always been other people involved, even from day one. Um, so, so when people see what you're doing, you, you just get mixed reactions. And there's, you know, I did get a lot of verbal abuse. We got a lot of verbal abuse. But, you know, but we haven't had that for years, years and years. I mean, so the changes that have taken place in that 10 years are phenomenal. You know, from where it was and, and the reactions we used to get and the, the climate we had to operate in and the challenges we faced, you know, now, 10 years later, completely different, you know, a lot, a lot easier than it was, you know, when we first started, yeah. Right, I see. So there's more of an understanding now? Much more, much more, yeah. Which is good, you know, I mean, it's education, that's part of it, you know, it's, yeah. Okay, so have there been any instances, you know, where other people have tried to take over your role at the soup kitchen and make it a completely Chinese-run operation? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. What, who, who really would want to, you know, do a takeover bit of a soup kitchen? It's ridiculous, you know. I mean, just, it doesn't make sense. But, but yeah, it, it happened. I mean, but but I've I've never. I, I understand your question, but you said to make it a Chinese organisation. You know, I've never really considered this a foreign organisation anyway. It's, yes. it's people working together, helping people who need help. You know, I've never seen it other, other than that. Um, uh, I know you've come down to the soup kitchen and have done for a long time. It's 99% Chinese volunteers anyway. Yes, it is. It's like, it, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is a locally run organisation. It's a team now anyway. We have a team of managers, all Chinese. So I've never from day one thought of it as like a foreign thing coming here and doing this in China. So it's never been that way. It's never been put out that way. But in the early, early days, probably in about, after about a year and a half, some there were some people came with their own ideas and they, they, they probably saw some opportunities and they thought, well, yeah, we would we, we like this, you know, we'll have this then. And so, even though at that stage I was still, for the first few years I was buying all the food, I was paying for everything. And even the, the fact that I was paying for it, they still tried to throw me out and say, this is our we don't need anymore. And, 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 and that problem went away because these people had their own agenda. They weren't going to get the satisfaction, so they got bored and went on to something else. But that helps us in a lot of ways because from, it was from that point that we became more structured. We started to have little guidelines as to what a volunteer should do and, and then we, we had name badges and things. And so we, we became a more structured organisation as a result of those challenges. So all these challenges we faced have all helped us on the road and have as, got us where we are today. Okay, now uh, you say it is a local charity but it's actually British registered. Mm. The, a British registered charity that carries out its work here in China. Now, exactly why was the soup kitchen set up and registered in the UK as opposed to here in China? Uh, good question again. Uh, basically, as because I'm, I mean, yeah, we're a foreign NGO in effect. Yes. Um, because I'm a foreigner that started it. For any charity, be it a Chinese charity or otherwise, but for a Chinese charity to, to register and get legal status in China is extremely difficult. It's not easy even for a Chinese organisation. Always has been and it still is today. For a, for a Western perceived organisation to get registration in China, it's not actually even possible. It's not possible to register. And because in the early stages, 
we were we did have some challenges. It, it, it felt better that we had some kind of legal status that might give us a bit more credibility to, to say that this is what we, what we are. And I think it was probably around about two to three year point, maybe 2007, I think 2007, we registered with the, with the British Charity Association as, as, as a, as a non-government organisation. Not because we wanted to, but it, it felt better that, 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 you know, and it felt that we might be perceived differently if we were. It still gave us challenges, but at least we had, at least it gave us a bit more credibility. And we weren't able to register here. It wasn't an option and it still isn't. So, so, so moving on from that, what, what we've then done, as a, as a foreign organisation, all you can do is partner with somebody in China, an organisation in China. So, round about four years ago, around about four, four years ago, I'd say, we, we, registered, we partnered with the, we're in Shanxi province, and the, Shang, and the Shanxi province is like, it's got 65 million people, it's the size of the UK, it's a huge province. So we partnered with the local government charity association, and we've been partnered with them for four years. So that's, that, since that day, we've actually, we are now actually legal. Okay. And, and our UK registration, we actually f let it fall away last year because we just had admin costs and, and, and running expenses that we didn't need anymore because we're, we're now legal here and we're much more accepted. It's much easier for us to operate than it was 10 years ago. Okay, excellent. Now, uh, charities in China, you know, they've recently taken a lot of flack in recent years. I mean, we only have to look at the Red Cross scandals yeah, from about yeah. two or three years ago. Yeah. Do you find that people are maybe, or Chinese people, are maybe more willing to donate money and their time to your charity when they realise it is actually a foreign-based charity and not Chinese? Um, yeah, I mean the Red, Red Cross thing blew up. I can't remember when, maybe three or four years ago, maybe three years ago. Now, I'm not sure. Um, but there's always been that. There was always been issues around charity in China, always. And that's why 10 years ago there wasn't many organisations because people found it difficult to trust some of the organisations that were there. And it was always perceived that 30% went to a good cause and 70% went in somebody's pocket. You know, this is not come from me, this is, you hear this everywhere from everybody. Yes, you do. Um, and we've never been like that, you know. Uh, we've always been 100%. Whatever comes in goes out, we have no expenses, no one ex expenses at all. Of any description, no awards. We know this building is donated. We don't pay anything for anything. We we don't have any export, any transport costs. If we go out on projects, we buy our own food. We take our own food with us. You know, and I believe that's the way it should be. It's one hundred percent must be. You know, that that's for me how a charity should be. If somebody gives a pair of shoes. You give somebody who needs it. You don't you don't take them home and wear them yourself. But, you know, that's the same for me. Yes. And and when you ask about the money and the donations, as you know, Gary, we. We don't focus on money anyway, that's never that's not the most important thing to us. Our most important thing is service. Service comes first. If we've got our service right, we don't have to worry about anything else about how many volunteers we've got, have we got enough clothing to distribute, will we have vehicles, will we have will we have enough money to pay for our expenses? We focus on service and the rest takes care of itself. Um, but the Red Cross thing and, and all, all the perception around charities are that, that's been around for a long time. The Red Cross thing sort of blew things up. Whether or not that makes people more or less ready to trust us because they see this white face at the front, yes. uh, I don't know, you can only ask them, and I have no idea. But whether it, from the donation point of view, we, it helped us, and it, it probably wasn't because of the Red Cross thing, but that would have been a factor. Because we are completely transparent about everything that we do and with no overheads, we, I was always uncomfortable. I. I funded it for the first three to four years, and then we started, and up to that point we didn't really accept donations, we refused donations. From about the three year point we started to accept them, but I was always uncomfortable because I knew what the perception was in China about money and, and how, what the stigma that is around it and, and how we're using it. So I've always been extra careful to be more than transparent. So, so the situation we are in now, 10 years down the line, we've got at least eight managers, probably 10 now, we all meet once a month to discuss what we're doing and what projects we've got coming up. And, and, and I didn't want that money to be in my name. I didn't want one person to control it. And I wanted it to be transparent within the group as well. 
So we, we've now got different, three, three different bank accounts and they're in different people's names. Yes. Um, people have options. If they want to support us, they can. And if, if, if by supporting they come down a volunteer, they give a haircut, or they drive a car, or they make a donation, to us it's the same, it doesn't make any difference. But, but from the money point of view, and I've got something here, we, we, at our managers' meetings every month, we have a, we have a I do a spreadsheet, so this, this month's expenses, this month's donations, if we've had any, the balance of the bank accounts and where we are today, and yes. we've done that for years now. And the managers get that, that every month, and anybody can see this. I've shown the government this, I've shown the police this, and that's our way of saying, look, you know, we've got nothing to hide, that's what we've got, that's exactly where we're up to. Well, let's be honest though, I mean, the money that comes in and out of the soup kitchen, I mean, you're not talking about hundreds of thousands no, of no, US no. dollars, are you? No, it's, no, no, it's no, not no, it's a just... significant amount either. No, no. I mean, our running expenses in a year, and we, we run about 190 projects a year. But because we have no personal expenses, everything that comes in goes direct to people who need it. And a lot of things are donated. We get donated clothing, we get, we, some people donate medicine sometimes if, if we need it. They drive cars for us. You, you know, so much is given in kind rather than money changing hands, which is great because it makes it a community. It's a community organization. People just come and give and share in any way that they want to. So despite us running like 180, 190 projects every single year, our expenses in, in pounds are about seventeen thousand pounds, okay. and most of that goes on the food that we buy each time in the soup kitchen. So, it, like I say, it's not big numbers. And if at the end of the year, then we're there and thereabouts, so the money that's coming is, is paid our expenses, then we're happy. And if it isn't, we're going to carry on anyway, okay. because that's that's what we do. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, a few years back now, Chinese national television carried out a documentary on the soup kitchen. Now, exactly what impact did that have on the soup kitchen as a whole? Uh, there's been a few documentaries actually. Uh, and, and from day one, I've never really enjoyed the media stuff. You know how difficult it is for you to talk me into doing this. So, yeah. you know, no, you know, I've never really enjoyed the media. And we've never really encouraged it, encouraged it as an organisation either. And there's good reasons for that. I mean. People always put the argument about, well, if people know about you, it spreads the word and you get attention and, you know, it's a good thing, this, this story should be told. And I get that, and I agree with it. But, but the downsides of that story being told, it can have significant negative impacts on, on me personally, which I don't really worry about, but also the soup kitchen, and it's given us a lot of trouble over the years. So we've always tried to keep the media to an absolute minimum, and we turn loads away. And this is probably the first thing I've done for three or four years, but it's not that we haven't been invited and often pressure been put on to do interviews, but we've, I'd say it must be at least three years now, maybe more, that we've not done any interviews at all, because there's been a couple of good documentaries, but there's at one point when the media got completely out of hand and it was, you know, paparazzi city out here, I mean, it was just, it was dangerous, we had a lot of trouble and it brought a lot of trouble to the soup kitchen. And it wasn't invited, we didn't even want to do the interview. We, we didn't want this attention, we were invited to do it. And again, I understand why, but, 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 but when it comes down to it, it's us that, it's us that carry the flag. And it was adversely affecting the work we do. And at that point, that's when we had to say, no, we're not doing it anymore. We're happy to cooperate and spread the message, you know, because it, it is a good story, but, you know, when it starts affecting the work that we're doing significantly, and it was, then we had to say no more. So is that the reason why, I mean, in the past when I've brought the students here, you've actually stopped them from taking photos yeah, when yeah. they get the camera phones out. Is that the reason why? Because it was just out of control, paparazzi showing up, people with their camera phones yeah. and all that kind of thing? Yeah. You know, um, well, we've, we've had from day one, just people come to serve at Sukish and then mind that all the other, all the people around that help in different ways. We've had like 9,000 volunteers. And if all them people want to start sticking a camera in somebody's face, then, then that's not good, you know. Uh, and it wouldn't be that number, but it would be a significant number, because we are in the Far East, you know, and by culture, we, all, we have the image of the Japanese camera guy and the lady with a the, with the camera. That's fine, you know, but it's a cultural thing, and there's a lot of people here enjoy, and now the world of the selfies taken over, you know, it's all gone crazy. You know, and we can't allow that here, you know. It's one, it, it, it gets out of hand, and two, it's, it's, it's a matter of respect. There's people coming here 
This is their home. They come and eat three times a week. You know, they're having, they're having their dinner and there's somebody sticking a camera in the face. Well, it's not going to happen. We're not going to allow it now. So we, we have to, it's a matter of respect. It's a matter of respect. Okay, now, uh, in China, there's a lot of people throw this stereotypical notion around that Chinese people just aren't interested in helping others if they aren't a member of their family or they aren't a member of their own, you know, Guangxi network. Now, obviously you, surely running a charity, you must have seen much that would dispute that idea. No, never. No, never. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's weird. Yeah, absolutely right, yeah. They are, yeah. I mean, as I said before, our volunteers, like, we've had 9,000. And that's not the people in the periphery that donate clothing, that drive cars, that, that are just supporting you anyway, you know. Um, and out of those 9,000, it's like 99% Chinese. We've, we've had groups come from the States, from, from, from England and, and, and the UK, uh, from, from Europe. We get groups come from France a few times, and, and obviously a lot of school groups from within China, different parts, more so in the Xi'an city, but also from different parts. But, but you know, overall, that's like 95 to 99% Chinese people. And, and it, it's true that their culture is more family oriented. That, that's true. That there's no, you know, there's no issue with that, yes. and that's a good thing. But what I found is, and this is why, this from from the first couple of months, I realised the value of the soup kitchen, and why I, I was happy to continue, was when I couldn't find anywhere to volunteer. There's no meaningful organisations. I just started buying food and giving it out. After that happened, and then people started to come saying, "Can I help? Can I? Can I join in?" What I realised was that there's actually a lot of people out there that also want to do some meaningful stuff that they could believe in, but they know where to go either, just just the same as I hadn't. So I don't think it's fair, a fair comment. I understand where it comes from, I don't, but I don't think it's a fair comment to say that Chinese don't give and they don't, they're not willing to do charity and they don't share. What I found is, in my experience, they're absolutely willing to give and they're absolutely amazing, they're brilliant. This organisation wouldn't exist without them. And you know, what they do and the effort they go, go to and what they give is just phenomenal. I mean, after we finish this now, there's me and three managers going to, into a, they've taken time off work and we're going to a school because we're running, we're organising a new project that we're, that we're doing. So they, you know, the, the effort these people put in is, is astounding and I'm constantly astounded. I don't have another job or anything else here. I'm just doing this, but they all have lives, they have families, they have jobs, they have all the other stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. Some of the volunteers that come down here, we, 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 there's one lady who's been coming for nearly nine years, week in, week out. She's been a manager for years, she runs, she's organised all the projects, she runs all the weekend projects. I've got numerous examples of volunteers that have been coming for nine years, eight years, seven years, six years, and they come week after week after week. So, in my experience, they're absolutely amazing and, and I'm astounded, and I probably wouldn't if this was me joining another organisation in a different country, I probably wouldn't have been that dedicated. I might give it six months and then they've done, done, something, done something different. Okay. So phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. So we'll continue. Now, obviously going back, I understand that you were quite successful in the UK. You had two successful companies. And what you, you know, what you've actually done is that you sold everything you owned, your house, your businesses, your car and <laughs> you move to China, you live a very frugal and simple existence and you feed the homeless. I mean... Yeah, it doesn't get dafter than that, does it? Yeah. <laughs> How do general members of the Chinese public react when you tell them this story? Well, one, I, 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 I try not to tell the story if I can help it. Um, why? Why? Because... I... Uh, I get... I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't. It's not just Chinese people. I try not to tell. It. I try not to tell the story in general because I, I don't like the attention. Really, it was some decisions I made in my life, which I'm happy I made. I think they were good decisions for me personally. Uh, the, some decisions I made, and I, I made some choices, and I came and I did, did this thing, and I don't think of anything more than that. So making it into something else, making it into a, a, a thing or a big thing or whatever, then it's not really. I'm never really that comfortable with it, so, yeah. Oh, it kind of makes you look like a martyr, do you feel, and you don't <laughs> feel like you're a martyr. I might not go that far, but, it, but it's clearly, it's an unusual kind of story and whatever, and, 
you know, I'm probably just that more comfortable having not, if I if I can get away with not telling it. Yeah. Okay. Now this year the soup kitchen celebrates its tenth anniversary. Yeah. Did you believe when you served your first meal to a homeless person it would still be going ten years later? It's funny, really, because that that um, that. For, that, when I met that lady that afternoon, I went back and I meditated that, that night, and that's when it came up that I'd need to go out and find her again and uh, buy her some food, and if not, then start your own. I mean, that came through that evening. And when, when as, as I was contemplating that, then it was clear that, I mean, I don't do things by halves. I tend, you know, I'm either in or I'm out. I either, I'm not going to do it, or I'm going to do it 200%. So, so I didn't know what was going to happen, but, uh, but my feeling was that I was probably embarking on a sort of a longer term project. But I had no way of knowing that, it was just a feeling. Um, but from that very first day, because of the challenges we were facing, and I knew the challenges that, that we, we could expect to face in the future, it wasn't going to be a smooth ride, for all the reasons stated earlier about the new culture and, you know, it was a new thing. It was never going to be a smooth ride, um, so it was all. It was always, always, and still is, just one day at a time. So whilst I always felt it, it could survive, and if, you know, and if it does or it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But I, but I felt that if it, if it was a good thing, then it, then it would have legs. But but it's always ever been one day at a time, and it still is because things change quick here, and things things change quick anywhere. So we've only ever had today. And we may be doing it tomorrow, we may not. But, but that's always been the way I, I, I viewed it. And so we've never even planned. We never plan. We have no strategy. We just keep evolving and keep rolling along. And things just happen naturally. Um, and I think that served as well. I think that might be one of the reasons we're still here. We didn't come with this big master plan how we're going to take over the world. It's just like, we're just here doing our little thing and let's see what happens. And I think that philosophy may have helped to survive today. Okay. Indirectly. And that wasn't a master plan, it just happened that way. <laughs> Again, it just snowballed and it yeah. kept going, right? It's it's evolved, yeah, evolved, yeah. yeah. So, uh, the last question. Uh, do you believe the soup kitchen carries a more proactive or reactive approach to the issues of homelessness and poverty alleviation? Yeah, that's a good question as well. I mean, and this touches on other things that, that we hear a lot, and I have to be honest, I, I believed in the past when I was in Europe and I was working in the soup kitchen in, in Paris, you know, and I had the question like, why are we giving these younger people food? You know, they should be out getting jobs and looking at themselves, you know, that the old giving them fish or teaching them to fish uh, concept. And, and there's obviously, there's sense in that, but, but, but I've moved on from that as well, you know. So are we active or are we proactive? We're, we're both. We're, we're both. And a lot of people just see us as a soup kitchen. We just serve meals. You know, people come, they eat, eat for free. And nothing else happens, you know. And what happens behind the scenes, they, they would have no, no understanding of it. They, they, would, they would never see the change in people that happens over years. And also the fact that we, we run a lot of other projects. Out of those 190, we run a lot of other projects like uh, we've repaired a school, a village school. We, we deliver clothing to villages. We deliver wheelchairs. We've helped 90 plus homeless guys find work. Um, homeless kids go home and reunite with their families. We um, we taught English. We we we, we, we got a guy, a guy a prosthetic leg and got him. He'd been on the streets for seven years. We we got him a leg, an apartment, a job. I mean, we do lots and lots of stuff that would be perceived as proactive. Um, but we just we're just seen as um, as a as a soup kitchen to serve buns and soup. But. But the full picture is, is, is not that, you know, we, we do a lot more than that. I know, it's kind of, I had an individual say to me once when I explained that I actually volunteer, I volunteer here from time to time, his idea was that the soup kitchen perpetuates the problem of homelessness. And I was like, well, not really, they do a lot, you know, a lot of training, teaching people new skills. And like you were saying, and you said this to me the other night when we went for food, uh, in discussion about this interview, you said it's the old, you know, either give a fish or teaching someone how to fish. And like you said, some people, you can't teach them how to fish. No, no. And, and that's right. So, 
And what it is, there's a lot of organisations out there teaching people to fish. And that's great, that's great work. But we're only a little organisation, we're not the Red Cross, we're, we're, we're not, you know, we're not these multi-international with huge budgets. So we just do what we can do. And if, if for some of those people it's just to give them fish, that's fine. And if for some people it's that we, we can actually teach them to fish, it's within our, our ability and our, in Chinese it's Nung Li, our, our ability, our skill set, our resources, we have the resources to do that, then yes we'll do it. But there's nothing wrong with just giving people fish if they need it. Because as you just said, there's whole groups of people that... that there's, that for me, there's three groups of people. There's some people that, you, that will never be able to fish for themselves, that need looking after, the old, the disabled, the mentally disabled, street kids. There's some people that, that can be taught to fish, but need time. They need time to change, to rehabilitate, to... To, to get back into society. And there's others that don't want to be taught to fish. That's fine. But of, of all those three, that is the smallest group. The ones that aren't willing to be taught to fish, that don't want to get back on their own feet, that don't want to be in control of their lives. That is a small group. But with, with, there's some of them, and that's, all, that's fine. But for those people, that, for those people that, that can't fish for themselves, somebody needs to look after them. And there aren't many organisations out there doing it. So we're happy to give them miracles, feed them, clothe them, give them medical care, because who else is doing it, you know, and if, if we get stick for that, then I make no apologies for it, because that's what we do, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. Then there's these other people that we've got loads of stories of where we you first meet somebody, if, if the first time they came to the soup kitchen, we offered them a job, they wouldn't take it. And there's a lot of reasons that they, they, a lot of reasons they've got for not trusting you, because of what society's done for them over a long period of time. Didn't you tell me a story about a guy, he found a job working in construction and they didn't pay him for eight months? Ten months, ten months. And that's, these stories get out, and one, it's a common occurrence, and when the stories get out, people find it difficult to trust these companies that are offering work, because, what you know, they've got, if that, that guy had no comeback, he didn't get paid for ten months, but he did his job. He, 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 he fulfilled his side of the bargain, but he didn't get paid. He couldn't go on then because he'd no face, no Mienza. Yes. So it, it, it was even a worse situation than before he got the job. So, so these people need time to trust, you know. So, over, and that might take one or two years. And then that same guy that we might have asked two years ago, do you want a job? And he says no. He, he might be coming to us in two years saying, Tony or whoever he's speaking to, can you help me find a job? And we see that all the time. And, and if we can help them, we will. We can't help everybody, but we can help some. And if we can, we do. But, but that aside, there's countless numbers of people that I can walk around the city now and on. We went for a walk around. I, I'd speak to four or five guys that used to come to the soup kitchen and they've got themselves on their feet. You know, after they've had a year or two of somebody actually respecting them, feeding them, treating them like a human being again, clothing them, giving them showers, haircuts, whatever they've needed, just speaking to them like, a, like an equal then they've actually built their own self-esteem up and they've got their own jobs. They've found their own jobs, menial little jobs like looking, looking after the car parts for bicycles or maybe working on the streets or working in shops. The numerous, numerous people, you know, and, and people will not see that. They, they don't see that side of it. They just think, well, you're, you know, you, you're just wasting your money and just giving away free food. But, you know, they don't see what goes behind the scenes of the soup kitchen and, you know, the impact it has. So. So yeah, giving fish or teaching people to fish, both both need to be run, both need to be available to people. And if and if, if we're giving, if sometimes we're just giving fish, then, then that's great. So you think it's not as straightforward as just giving them fish or teaching them how to no, fish? It's both. much more complex. Yeah, yeah. You need both. You need both approaches. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the end of the questions, Tony. Thank you very much. Is there anything you'd like to add on the end? I. Don't think so. <laughs> We've covered a lot, and uh, you know, I mean, this is ten years of stuff, and the things that you know, people have no idea how busy everybody is in the background, you know. Uh, and and I've, I've remembered what I could remember, and hopefully, it's you know, some interest. So, but thank you for uh, for doing this. Right, thank you very much, Tony. Thanks. Thanks.